Hey there, have you ever heard of the 1931 movie featuring a classic Hollywood actor? Yeah, that one. Who's your favorite actor in it? There are so many funny, shocking, and sad facts about this film that you won't want to miss. Stick around because we've got a lot to cover. So, what makes this movie stand the test of time? What enduring qualities do you think keep it as a symbol of the industry? Share your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to hear your stories and memories now about that movie. It's a tale of a man struggling with his inner demons. You know, the one where he transforms into a completely different person. It's a roller coaster of emotions with twists and turns that'll keep you on the edge of your seat. Anyway, let's dive into the fascinating world of this classic film. Stay tuned for some interesting tidbits and behind the scenes secrets. Trust me, you won't want to miss it. With tremendous special effects and a fast moving story, the 1931 adaptation of Robert Louis Stevenson's classic novel presents a compelling portrayal of duality in man. Directed by Robin Mamoulian, this version stands out for its innovative cinematography and set designs, capturing the essence of Victorian London. Mamoulian's direction, along with Carl Struss's cinematography and Hans Dreyer's set designs, brings to life the foggy gaslit streets and the eerie atmosphere of the good doctor's laboratory. While the romance subplot may feel somewhat melodramatic, the film compensates with its portrayal of Hyde's sinister character, depicted with jagged teeth and sadistic tendencies. In this pre-code Hollywood era, the film pushes the boundaries of censorship, exploring themes of sensuality and violence. The transformation scenes, using different colored gels, are groundbreaking for their time. The adaptation updates the themes of the novella, delving into the darker aspects of human nature. Jekyll, portrayed as a pioneering scientist akin to Frankenstein, experiments on the mind rather than the body. As one character aptly remarks, there is a beast in man that stirs when you put a sword in his hand, a sentiment that encapsulates the film's exploration of duality. Despite its age, this adaptation remains relevant, offering a nuanced exploration of the human psyche. Its enduring appeal lies in its ability to captivate audiences with its rich storytelling and memorable characters. Before they became famous actors, Tom London and Frederick March had different jobs. Tom worked as a train engineer, builder, and draftsman. Meanwhile, Frederick did modeling alongside acting to make money. Frederick made history by winning an Academy Award for his role in a horror movie, the first actor to do so. This didn't happen again until Anthony Hopkins in The Silence of the Lambs. Their performances in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde are still loved by fans of horror movies. In a world of change, some people surprise us with the twists and turns of their lives. One such person is Miriam Hopkins, a strong supporter of progressive democratic politics. She backed presidents like Roosevelt, Truman, and Johnson. During the politically charged times of the 1930s and 40s, she got involved in the Hollywood Democratic Committee, playing a significant role in the social and political scene. Frederick March had a different path initially. He worked in banking, but had a life-altering moment after a near-death experience. This pushed him towards acting, diverting him from his original career plan. Amidst ups and downs, Miriam Hopkins went against societal norms by embracing motherhood during a gap between marriages. In 1932, she adopted a baby boy named Michael, who became the center of her world. She often referred to him as the most important person in her life. Their stories intertwine with the history of Hollywood and broader politics show the diverse paths people can take, going beyond what's expected of them. The legacies of Miriam Hopkins and Frederick March reflect the very choices that shape human lives. In the movie, actor Frederick March played important roles. He was one of the first people to win Tony Awards for acting in 1947, along with Jose Ferrer, Helen Hayes, and Ingrid Bergman. March thought the number 12 was lucky, so he combined Frederick and his mother's maiden name Marcher to create his stage name, Frederick March. The scene where there's a big change in the movie, with the sound of a heartbeat, used director Robin Mamoulian's own heartbeat. He ran up and downstairs for two minutes to record it. This personal touch made the scene feel even more intense and added a lot to the movie's overall feeling. Three individuals played significant roles in a classic movie. One of them, known for his stage name, likely took inspiration from his father's stage name and a comedy partner's surname. He crafted a persona that resonated with audiences, blending charisma with a touch of enigmatic allure, much like the character he portrayed. Another, a consummate actor, was cast in multiple acclaimed films by director William Wyler. His performances were marked by a nuanced understanding of character, lending depth and authenticity to every role he undertook. The third, along with his second wife, supported the Democratic Party actively. 
Their involvement in political causes added another dimension to their public personas, shaping not only their careers, but also their legacies beyond the silver screen. In the annals of stage and screen, there lies a story woven with familial ties and artistic collaboration. Within this narrative, Rose Hobart, daughter of esteemed figures in the world of music, played a part. In the late 19th century, Edgar Norton brought depth to the character of Poole on stage. Interestingly, a lesser-known contributor, the nephew of Robert Louis Stevenson, lent his insights to the making of a movie adaptation, enriching its layers and captivating audiences. His subtle contributions shaped the final masterpiece, a testament to the timeless fascination with duality explored in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. This engagement underscores the collaborative essence of filmmaking, where even the smallest input leaves a significant impression. The nephew's involvement ensures the enduring allure of his uncle's tale, transcending generations. In 1934, Miriam Hopkins was chosen by Sasso B. DeMille to play Delilah opposite Henry Wilcoxon as Samson, but the film was postponed for more than a decade. When DeMille finally started production on Samson and Delilah in 1949, the role went to Hedy Lamarr. Holmes Herbert appeared in three films that had been selected for the National Film Registry by the Library of Congress as being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant The Invisible Man, The Life of Emile Zola, and The Adventures of Robin Hood. Frederick March's stunts were performed by Chick Collins. Frederick March's performance in a 1931 movie inspired the creation of a well-known comic book character. His portrayal had a big impact, influencing the character development in a completely different field. One of the co-stars of the movie faced a tragic end in 1972 during a special screening event. Despite having concerns about her health, she attended the event and unfortunately passed away, which left a sad mark on the history of the film. During the war in 1943, Frederick March went beyond acting and contributed significantly to the war effort. He traveled thousands of miles on USO tours and volunteered at the stage door canteen, showing his dedication beyond just being an actor. In 1972, another co-star faced a heartbreaking demise during a celebration event. Her passing at the occasion reminded everyone of the unpredictability of life. Frederick March's dedication to the war effort in 1943 showcased his commitment beyond the silver screen. His actions left a meaningful impact that went beyond just acting. In the 1931 movie Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Frederick March, early in his career, changed his last name from McIntyre Ellis to March, as suggested by director John Cromwell. This change came about after March's first wife proposed combining their names, which he found unsuitable. John Barrymore, who experienced a significant comeback in the 1920 silent version, declined the leading role in this film. However, Frederick March reprised his role in a radio adaptation of the movie broadcasted on November 19, 1950 by the Theatre Guild on the Air. 